Direct from Foxborough, Massachusetts, the gem of Norfolk County, and taped at the studios of Foxborough Cable Access, it's Foxborough Central. And here's your host, Bob Hickey. And welcome to another fantastic episode of Foxborough Central. I am Bob Hickey, your host. Thank you so much for taking the time to join with me and my guests as we talk about the people, events, and organizations that make Foxborough truly the gem of Norfolk County. Now, perhaps you've noticed that we are not in our normal studio environment. We're in a wonderful home up in Concord, Massachusetts, and we have the pleasure and honor of interviewing a uh, renowned author, Gregory McGuire. Gregory, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us well, here in Foxborough Central. Thank you, and, th and thanks for coming to visit, too. Well, <laughs> it's a beautiful home, and uh, I wish we had uh, multiple shows so that we could take the tour and do the whole dance because uh, it's it's an incredible place but you have an incredible story and I'm more interested in talking about you and also how we in Foxborough are going to get to get up close and personal with you when you come to support our Boyden Library at an upcoming gala so let's start off with the important thing hi welcome welcome to Concord and thank you for coming well thank you so much so we'll start off with uh, you are the author of many books, but I guess the one that everybody will know you by is Wicked. Right. That wonderful story. I, my first book was published 40 years ago this summer, so I've been around for a while, but everybody being successful has to have one moment where you sort of intersect with public life or you haven't been successful in that regard. So Wicked was my moment, and that was about 26, 27 years ago. And it was a, my first novel for adults after 16 years of writing for children. Really? So it uh, sort of blew my, <laughs> my sense of myself as a struggling artist out of the water. I had to give up my cold water fourth floor walk up. <laughs> you know, I had to get used to going to the bank and depositing little royalty checks, which I'd never uh, had before. Uh, that's a tough problem to have. It, yes, sir. Of it course. is. So, but so you're a children's author for 16 years, so what's, and I, I ask this only because I'm a huge um, Wizard of Oz fan. When uh -huh. I was a child growing up, I, my parents bought me all the Frank Baum ones, and oh. I, I read them all multiple times. I went through the cycle, and then I went through the cycle. Uh, not many of us can tell you who TikTok was or why he existed, <laughs> but uh, I, I can share that I still think he's a little creepy, but that's okay. That's okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I was I was more I I was more in Camp Tin Woodsman than Camp TikTok, but that's okay. <laughs> uh, so, your 16 years as a children's author. Let's start there. That's interesting. Well, it actually feeds into the whole notion of what I'm going to be doing uh, when I come to speak, because uh, I have. Uh, I grew up in the library. Mm -hmm. I grew up, I used to give a lecture that said, Orphaned at Birth and Raised by Kindly Librarians. That was the title of it. Uh, it, is, uh, it is not entirely true, but in fact, my mother died in childbirth when I was born. And uh, my parents were not prosperous. Mm -hmm. So the public library was, in fact, a haven and sure. a, a chapel, a chapel of story. A repository of public health mm -hmm. and possibility for me, who felt somewhat constricted and perhaps somewhat guilty and responsible for the change in our in our family personnel because of the fact of my birth. So ha that being the case, I lived in the library. I loved it. I educated myself through the uh, blessings of the public library as a refuge. As it was a refuge, and it was a university, and it was a health spa, and it was a, a psychiatry office. It's also it non-judgmental because they're books. They're, they're books, and you can go back to them as many times as you want, and nobody questions when you're taking out or why. The great fantasies of the late 19th and uh, 20th century, up until the 70s when I was a kid, uh, Everything from Alice in Wonderland to Peter Pan, Wendy the Willows, Wendy the Pooh, Mary Poppins, the Narnia books, Tolkien, oh. they all brought me out of the capsule of guilt and, I won't call it poverty, it wasn't poverty, but it was lower middle class restriction sure. and strict parents. They brought me out and they let me do that, well, now we would say, you know, Aladdin's magic carpet ride, you know, they brought me around the world. Um, 
But they really did. And it does so open the universe. It yeah. opens the universe. It throws up in the windows. throws up in the intellectual possibilities uh, for a person who was going to be uh, somewhat self-employed and somewhat self-involved, I'm afraid to say. Uh, but when I began to write, the first thing I wanted to do was to contribute to the bank of children's literature to try to do for somebody else what had been done How for me. How interesting. Okay. Yeah. So right. right away, I, I, I sold my first book when I was 23, I but think. But isn't it interesting that gave you the career direction and that became your drive? Yes. And so all the time that I've been an adult writer, which is now 26, 27 years in print, most of my adult books also are pinned or hinged on the work that was written for children. Because that work, the great fantasies of the last hundred years, continue to support and nourish my imagination and my sense of the possibilities of life. Wow, interesting. Of course, I'm talking with Gregory McGuire, who is the author of many, many books, Wicked being one of them, and he will be coming to Foxborough on uh, at the annual gala celebration for the Boyden Library on Wednesday, September 26th. It's going to be held at the Maryland Robin Performing Arts Center, and we hope that you will be uh, one of the ones in attendance. Uh, you can find out more information at the Boyden Library website, at the orphan.org website, or just by stopping by the Boyden Library and talking to the library personnel. They're great. They want to talk to you. Uh, Manu Late, the director, and I were talking the other day, and he really wants people to come in, get their tickets through the library, so you can see what's going on down on the corner of Bird and Baker Streets at our Boyden Library. But the keynote speaker, the uh, reason for coming out, will be... Uh, Fascinating, fascinating author, uh, Gregory McGuire. So, the 16 years of children, and we're not going to have enough time to get to all the questions, so right. I apologize, yeah, but the 16 years of being a children's author, what was your, you didn't write about turnips and, and peanuts, did you? You wrote, <laughs> what, what sort of... I, I, I began as a fantasist. I began okay. writing fantasy, again, because fantasy is a, is a wonderful metaphor for the adventure of thinking. And then... It is, and also, depending upon style, I think one of the reasons why we all love the, the Bugs Bunny cartoons is because there's adult humor in with the children's humor, so the children would enjoy it. But as adults, we also enjoy it. Uh, yes. Maybe through suitors isn't necessarily the route we want to go down, <laughs> but there's got to be that certain maturity to writing to make it quality for everybody. And I guess that's why it, Wicked really took off with yes it. And, well and i read the book well wicked was really uh, sometimes people forget this but wicked was published on an adult list it was it was in fact scrupulously uh billed as my first novel although the books that i wrote for children were children's novels in the way a wrinkle in time or harry potter are novels for children my books for children were were novels mm -hmm. but the publisher didn't want readers to be taking the novel Wicked and thinking, oh, this person's written children's books, so it's probably for my grandson. It was published for adults because it has, it has adult material in it, by which I mean it, it does. has power politics, it has sex, it has religion, it has abuse and uh, murder and disgrace and redemption. Some of those things can be implied in books for children, but this was a novel about the roots of evil, and that is not necessarily a subject that one wants to give to a somewhat quivering, uh, innocent eight-year-old. And depression, and self-analysis, yes. and, and fitting in at an adult level, and, and all those other things that made it such a fascinating read. Right. But using the characters that we all know, I'm well, how brilliant because you don't have to introduce the character. We, well, at least we think we know the characters. Right, right. Which is even great because you're peeling back the onion and adding layers here. And, and, and the salad that becomes <laughs> these characters. We thought we knew them, and now we're going back and thinking about the Frank Baum books. Oh, should we be sympathetic? Well, right. no, of course not flying monkeys, but at the same time. Well, that was my bait and switch because my original impression, intention uh, as I was getting ready to write Wicked was not to do, let's say, a Saturday Night Live parody of The Wizard of Oz. I didn't want to make fun of either the book sure. or the film. What I wanted to do was to talk about evil, and I wanted to harness my questions about evil to some sort of uh, armature, I guess is what I mean. I wanted to clothe an armature 
with a familiar story to make people feel comfortable and to make people actually perhaps not even notice that they were reading a novel of ideas. And that's what it is. It, it poses lots of different theories about what we mean by the word evil or wicked and where we think it came about. Uh, what is its fundamental nature? Is it a moral slant on thinking? Is it a biological impulse? Is it a part of the poison of creation? Mm -hmm. uh, there are so many ways to think about it. Well, I love the nature versus nurture uh, you know, discussion within and, and you are thinking of that as you go through the book. And then to have uh, you know, the characters actually become real people and then progress through their life, that's so fascinating. You know, the, one, one really uh, wonderful thing to me to think about is that when I began writing the novel, I intended the green-skinned witch, Alphaba, to, be, to become really ferociously evil, like, like a Hitler, like a Hannibal Lecter, somebody with no moral right. compass at all. And I was writing the first section. There's a scene where she's pawing on the floor. She's about two years old, and she pees on the floor. She urinates, and she puts down her face to smell her own urine, and she smiles. And I meant this, as I wrote it, to be a scene that was convincingly about how aberrant she was and how inhuman she was. Finished up for the day, put my manuscript away. Next morning, I got up, I read that section again, and my heart broke. I thought, oh, that poor little scrap of green humanity. Nobody is ever going to know who you are. And at that point, I decided I had to move my own aesthetic intentions about writing about how somebody becomes a sociopath or a mm -hmm. psychopath. I had to put those aside and just follow her through her life and find out who she was going to tell me that she really was. Wow. Yeah. It's exciting. Uh, I, I can't wait to have you come and talk <laughs> about it on our stage. So we again are talking to Gregory McGuire, who's the author of Wicked and many other things. I'd love to talk about some of your... We, when we talk about a 40-year career, it's unfair to say, oh, let's just talk within 30 minutes. Right. Later. Earlier works, your later works, it's, it's very unfair to you. Uh, but we're going to do it because that's what we do on television. Right. Um, and he's going to be appearing at the Maryland Robbins Center. He's going to be the feature guest with the Boyden Library in the annual gala this year. It is on Wednesday, September 26th. Uh, limited number of seats available. Uh, it's going to be the event of the season. So. Uh, stop by the Boyden Library and get your tickets. Uh, Manny Late is the uh, director and he has done such a great job putting this on as well as the uh, trustees of the Boyden Library and this is their annual gala celebration. So, cannot imagine uh, <laughs> where the discussion is going to go. So, and you clearly have a comfort level. Uh, you, you don't need to do this. Why do you support the libraries now? I mean, that was a long time ago you were a kid. I used to go to the library myself when I was uh -huh. a kid. And in my library in Winchester, Virginia, I would go up to the third floor stacks. So you can only get up and through a little circular uh -huh. metal thing. And I would stay up there for hours with the National Geographic and the Life magazines and the Times from uh, World War II. And I believe that I got a good, uh, at least my, my basic sense of history from uh -huh. you know, spending time in the stacks up there. So. But that was a long time ago. You know, who supports libraries these days? They're it old. Was the internet. Time ago. We don't need the libraries. Well, anymore. you know, there is an argument to be made for that, and people make that argument all the time, including in my beloved town of Concord, Massachusetts, where they rebuilt the high school and threw out all the library books in the high school. <laughs> you know, it's all—it's an internet station. It's they've got encyclopedias, dictionaries, and very capable librarians. But you want to take out a book, you go to the public library. Mm. Uh, I think that's wrong. I think there is a value. The library has two values to me. One is that it's a repository of the culture that we have accumulated for the last, you could say, 4,000 years. Sure. Uh, it is it's something else, though, besides that, because that is the internet. The internet also accumulates culture and things that are not particularly cultured. There it is, we all know what it is. But the library is also that fundamental sanctuary in a community that becomes the lungs, I think, 
of the community. It is a safe space. It is a free space. It is intellectually available to anybody at any level of their thinking, of their being, of their transforming. Uh, and how many places do we have in our towns, let's just talk on the town-wide uh, system, that are equally open to every citizen? Sure. Or to even people who, who are not citizens. Uh, not everybody goes into every church. Not everybody can afford to go to every private school. Not everybody shops at the same store. Not everybody is welcome in every church. Not everybody You're is right. welcome in every school. And not everybody has the economic background to be able to shop in every store. Right, that's absolutely true. And that is a great testament as to why libraries are so important. It's, it's, I, I, I forget whether it was Plato, I think it was Plato, he, who has talked about uh, a community needing the third place. That is to say, if we're lucky enough to have work, uh, each of us uh, is benefits from having a home and having a job, but we need a third place that is neither our work nor our home, and that is the place, in a sense, where we breathe, and the community needs that third space as well. It used to be, it used to be that in smaller communities that were more homogenous, the church really would be that, sure. and in many communities, the church still performs that function for a lot of its people, but we are not um, homogenized anymore. No, we're not. Yeah. And therefore, the library is even more important as, our, as we become more and more aware of the different populations that our community serves. Fox Bar has a, uh, and I'll, I'll give a little toot out for Fox, so when you do come, I, I hope you'll uh, take time. Our, our library, we just had a, an $11 million expansion of our library. I'll be there tomorrow. And, well, <laughs> but it, it is a, great community resource, but also there's leadership in there. Manny Lane, I'll, I'll give him a little shout out, Manny. Hope you're doing well. Mm -hmm. uh, but he has really created, and, and before him also, uh, we just have had great leadership in our library. And the programs and the grants that are coming through and the community and cultural and uh, social resource that it is, I think that's the place for it. So. You know, we can talk about books, we can talk about the internet, but you're right, it is more than just a building. It is just more than a shelf full of books. That said, books are so key. And I, I say the same thing when it comes to the internet. You know, newspapers are dead. Well, yeah, but who do you think creates the content that the internet is stealing from? It? Right. It right. is the newspapers. Right. And we here in Massachusetts, we love WBZ News. Well, I can tell you exactly what the stories in WBZ are because I've read the Boston Globe. Right, exactly. And then I can tell you exactly what's going to be on the other online services because we've read the Boston Globe. Right. So without the newspapers, all this other stuff is not as robust and as and so the libraries play such an integral role. Well, there's a, there's, in development. there's in another how we grow another up. benefit to the library as a repository of books per se that that old fashioned technology the book. Uh, and that is, I, I become more and more convinced of this the more I try to read online and the more I, I listen to audible books as I go about my walking. Uh, and that is that, it's, it's an anecdotal point, but I think that I've heard other people agree with me when I say it. And that is that what one reads on the page has more impact and is more memorable than what one reads on the screen. It's partly the, phys you know, the physical act of being able to identify pacing, timing, and depth of a, of a piece by the physicality of a book. It has 222 pages, and you know, when you're a kid, you know you have to read a book, you read, I'm on page 12, how many pages do I have left, you know? Uh, but in fact, that physicality of where on a page a section comes, how far in a book we're in, helps us engage with the act and the art of reading in a way that a screen will not allow, no matter how many bells and whistles it has. Interesting, interesting. I'm uh, speaking, of course, with Gregor McGuire, who is the author of Wicked. After Wicked, you still have a whole life. After Wicked, but yes, I mean, well, Wicked came, the novel came, it, it, it did um, so surprisingly well that when I called my agent to say, you know, I got a check and I think there's an extra zero there's on the extra end. Comma in there. And he said, you know, I thought so too. <laughs> but, I, but I checked with the publisher and this is an accurate royalty check. Uh, after that, uh, I continued to publish adult novels and then the, the play 
uh, came up, and I will talk about how the play came to be and what its effect on my life has been when I uh, come to Foxborough. And we're uh, not going to touch into that, because that's why we want you to come out to the Marilyn Robinson. And I will not sing. Well, but, uh, 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 it is, uh, but it was, it did boost uh, my name recognition. It boosted my possibilities in life. So much so, here's, here's my you know, name dropping and brag, you know, my brag bag. I went uh, backstage to meet Lin-Manuel Miranda at Hamilton when I saw it, uh, before, when he was still playing the lead role, and he said, Grant me McGuire, can I take a selfie with you? <laughs> and I thought, wow, you know, that's like, that's great. I thought it's, you know, I don't even know how to take selfies, so I couldn't have done it. <laughs> but that's what, that's what Wicked the Musical did, which was to elevate my stature sure. in the greater world above that which most authors expect to reach in their life. And I have enjoyed it. I haven't tried to play it for more than it's worth because I'm a storyteller and a quiet, reflective person, first, last, and always. But let's face it, who doesn't like being recognized on the sidewalk once a year? It is fun. Yeah. It is fun. But also using that platform for good and to promote things that are near you and give you the power to be able to support that. So I understand you. You mentioned earlier with the Boston Public Library and, and some yes. other of your things. So you've been able to do good with this fame. Well, in fact, my uh, I, I've actually put together a foundation on the basis of uh, excess funds that I didn't need and that I don't need. And the it's called the Alphaba Fund, and it supports... What a great name. Thank you. It's, I think she would be pleased. I think, <laughs> I think she is pleased. It supports uh, women and children's health and education in the third world, okay. because I have adopted children from the third world, and that is important to me, not just to take care of my own, but to take care of my family. Mm -hmm. We are all family. Uh, it supports uh, environmental causes, and it supports causes in literacy and education here in the United States. Outstanding. So it must, you know, a, a shekel here, a shekel there, but I'm happy to be able to do it. And I've been on the board of a number of organizations, including the Boston Public Library, the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum, and a couple of nonprofits that, oh, casually I've helped found over the last 20 or 30 years. Well, I, and you know, it's wonderful to hear that because the, I, I think the best thing is to be able to pay it back and also pay it for it. And yes. clearly you're taking your role as a successful author and not just resting on it but playing it forward and, and making a change. I keep trying to buy a yacht but you know <laughs> I don't have an ocean to put it in. So. I grew up in the mountains. I'm okay <laughs> without the yachts. I'm okay without the yachts. So Gregor McGuire is going to be coming to the Boyden Library's annual gala. It's going to be held at the Maryland Robin Performing Arts Center on Wednesday, September 26th. You can get tickets for free at the Boyden Library. You can stop in and say hi to Manuel. He is there. Um, director, as we all know in Foxborough, and uh, he'll be happy to uh, help you out with that, as will any of the staff there. And also, you've mentioned the singing, and uh, one of the added truths, I don't want to give away too much what's going to happen at the Maryland Robbins Center, but we do have uh, Inspiration uh, Performing Arts Company. They're going to be there wow. and accompanying and uh, doing some... Uh, Doing some support. So oh, good! It's gonna I, be fun. Wow, that will be that will we'll be make fun. it fun for you. I will I will enjoy it, and I'll bring my pitch pipe. So I'm sure that if I hum in the background, I won't <laughs> you know make anybody lose their dinner. I think it'd be great that the entire theater is singing along. <laughs> so let's uh, let's uh, it'll help by drowning me out because I'll be singing also. I love to sing, and I've been told I shouldn't, so it's all good. But it's my theater, so why not? Why not? Why not? I, I once went to a fundraiser for I think cancer research. And the crowd was so excited to be supporting cancer research that when the uh, Mater D came and uh, Master Ceremonies came and clicked on the microphone, they wouldn't stop talking. And I, they were supposed to be introduced. I was supposed to speak to them for 20 minutes. That's what they paid for, and they wouldn't stop talking. So I went up to the microphone and waited a minute or two. And I just, I went, so. upon a star <laughs> and continued from there that shut them up <laughs> but they were happy to be shut up each other like what 
I don't have anything to follow up with that on. That is a phenomenal <laughs> way to end our program. I'm going to give you the last word, of course. I always do with my guests. But I'm going to remind everybody that Gregory McGuire is going to be coming to Foxborough. He's going to make the trek from Concord down to Foxborough uh, to support our Boyden Library, our wonderful resource, our community library, the one that is there for you on the corner of Baker and Bird Street. If you've been in there, then, of course, you know what a great place it is. If you haven't, you should make your way down there. Manny Late, our director, does such a great job of making sure that uh, the lights are on and the books are available as well as all the wonderful programs and uh, his staff are fantastic. We would love to see you also at the Marilyn Robbins Center for the Boyden Library's annual gala. The Boyden trustees uh, work hard to put this on every year and this is their phenomenal day to shine. Uh, their guest speaker, guest featured speaker, featured guest speaker, we can say it any way you want, <laughs> still the same guy, Gregory McGuire, author of Wicked. It's going to be on Wednesday, September 26th at the Maryland Robbins Center. There will be some uh, fine dining and uh, beverages as well as some musical guests, Inspiration Performing Arts Company, as well as a few other surprises. So it's well worth your time. Come on down, have some fun, support a great cause. Gregory, you get the last word, sir. I'm trying to think of what story I can tell that wraps everything up and all I can think of is again back to the importance of libraries. I so cherished them when I was a kid that I was afraid that the librarian would starve and the library would have to close. So I used to purposely keep my library books overdue so I would owe more on them when I came <laughs> she could buy more cups of Lipton cup soup. <laughs> Keep body and soul together. Keep serving me those books. So come to the library. and You don't even have to say hello to the library director. Just get some books. And uh, return back on time. But if not, help Manny pay his mortgage one dime at a time on, <laughs> on the past due number. So, Gregory, thank you so much My for pleasure. taking the time. And thank, thank you. you so much, everybody, for being with us here on Foxborough Central. Thank you so much also to our wonderful volunteers, in particular today's special uh, camera operator and producer, Jury Love. She's been phenomenal as she always is when she schedules our wonderful gifts. guests. If you would like to be a guest on Foxborough Central, why not contact us down at the station at 508-543-4757. We love to hear from you. And you can also see a replay of this if you don't catch it on Comcast 8 or Verizon 39 at our website www.fcatv.org. Until next time, Foxborough, have a great day. <laughs>